welcome back everybody. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Jill Piper from Brown University. Uh, she is also a director of ICM at the same university. Uh, uh, she will talk about the uh, about the colors method and the boundary value problem. Please welcome our last speaker of today. The subject of, of this talk is a small part of this large, active research program involving elliptic and parabolic boundary value problems of second order, of higher order, and of systems of equations. In particular, we're asking questions about sharp well-posedness and solvability of, these, uh, of a variety of these equations under varying and weak assumptions on the geometry of the domain in which they're defined, or on the regularity of the coefficients, or both. The kinds of questions and boundary values we're talking about are classical Dirichlet Neumann regularity problems that make the coefficients of these equations may be real or may be complex. And what we're going to do in this talk is focus on elliptic operators of second order in divergence form. And, and the reason for this focus is several. Um, in the first place, this is a foundational part of this program. It's this, these equations of, these elliptic equations of second order are really the first step in this larger program. Uh, and, and indeed, um, there are many open questions that remain, as well as many basic interesting questions which have only recently been, been resolved. The um, divergence form structure of these operators gives rise to a general theory of existence and uh, well-posedness and regularity of solutions to these operators. So there are equations of divergence form and not, non-divergence form. But unlike the non-divergence form equations, the structure of these equations with this, um, with this uh, particular divergence form is one of the possible generalization, variable coefficient generalizations of the Laplacian, which have a very rich theory. And, and these uh, equations of this type were, were considered in, in terms of the regularity theory in, in the 40s and the 50s uh, as, as the first step in understanding certain nonlinear equations, such as the minimal surface equation that we saw earlier in Fernando Cudo Marquez's talk. And over the years, the, um, the linear theory and its technology developed to solve these problems still continues to contribute to the nonlinear theory. So as I said, these are variable coefficient generalizations of the Laplace operator. So when the matrix of coefficients a, i, j is the identity, solutions to this equation are harmonic functions. The, the matrix is assumed to be uniformly positive definite. It's compactly written in the what? <laughs> it's compactly written in the following form, with um, this divergence form structure, and. Uh, um, I'm going to divide these, these uh, equations into three categories. In the first place, we, the, the matrix will have real, and the matrix will have real coefficients and be symmetric. This is, a, this is a very large class, an interesting class of operators, because the divergence form structure and the symmetry of the matrix are preserved under changes of variable. So, if this is new to you, you might think of this, of operators like this, as changes of variable from the Laplacian, from the Laplacian. You take the Laplacian in some domain, you make a certain change of variable, a quasi-conformal change of variable, you get a matrix which has this structure. And then, and then um, these matrices can have real coefficients, but, but the matrix may fail to be symmetric. And these sorts of matrices arise in homogenization theory and really are a first step towards a general theory for complex coefficient matrices because if you have a solution to a complex coefficient matrix, it can be regarded as a solution to a non-symmetric elliptic system. 
And finally, in the complex coefficient case, a lot of problems, even in the second order theory, are wide open. One of the most famous problems for complex coefficients arose in Cato's perturbation theory. Uh, Cato formulated a problem in a very abstract setting that was proven to be false, but Macintosh reformulated this, and this reformulation is, in fact, a a boundary value problem for a special kind of complex coefficient matrix, which, <laughs> which took decades to solve. It was solved in 2002 by a, ser in a series of papers by, by some or all of the following five authors. And further progress in, in complex coefficient matrices has, has, been, has continued by all of these authors, as well as with contributions by Axelson, C. Kim, Meiboroda. And I'm really not going to be saying much more about complex coefficient matrices in this talk, so um, let me uh, 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 turn to the next subject. So what I really want to convince you of today is, is something that, uh, the, uh, to borrow a phrase, I'll call the unreasonable effectiveness of Carlson measures in this elliptic boundary value uh, theory in the sense that many of the questions that one can ask about solvability of, of boundary value problems uh, can be framed in terms of Carlson measures or use the technology of Carlson measures to, to answer these questions. So let me tell you what a Carlson measure is. So um, most of the time in this talk, I'm gonna be living in the upper half space and, and the <clears throat> And the difficulties that are, are, um, that are brought on by these operators will all be reflected in the non-smoothness of the coefficients. But you can formulate most of these problems on, on domains with much weaker boundary conditions, Lipschitz domains or even weaker. But uh, just to keep things simple, I'll, I'll stick with the upper half space. So a Carlson measure is the following. So you, you have a cube, Q, in Rn and you form a cube that sits on top of it. And so now you have an extension of the cube to another cube in the upper half space. A Carlson measure lives in this upper half space. And the measure, and it's a Carlson measure, if for any cube Q, the Carlson measure of the cube that lives in the upper half space is bounded by a constant times the Lebesgue measure of the face. We're going to see examples of Carlson measures in just a moment. Let me just say that, that, that this notion of a Carlson measure was invented over 50 years ago to solve completely unrelated problems that had it arose in, in interpolation uh, of problems for bounded analytic functions introduced by Carlson and features and, and solutions to the corona problem four years later. But it was Charles Pfefferman who connected Carlson measures to potential theory. And so that's going to be important to us. So to connect Carlson measures to potential theory, I first need to recall the space of bounded mean oscillation. So a function belongs to this space if, on average, it differs from its average by a bounded amount. Now, the, the space of bounded mean oscillation functions contain bounded functions. If a function is bounded, it satisfies this condition. But the space of bounded mean oscillation functions also contain unbounded functions. So here's the connection with Carlson measures observed by Charles Pfefferman. If you take the harmonic extension of a BMO function, take the Poisson extension of a function that satisfies this BMO condition on the plane, then this expression t, t is the transverse variable, t times grad u squared is a Carlson measure. Notice the connection between this expression and the equation, the Laplacian comes into play here, the fact that u satisfies the Laplacian. So um, this, this, character, this property of harmonic functions was introduced by Charles Bethelman, again, in a completely different context. It was first used to prove the duality of H1 and BMO, and, um, but its a connection with potential theory is going to prove to be important. Now, before I describe the Dirichlet problem, 
when for harmonic functions or for these variable coefficient operators with non-continuous data, I want to remind you that non-tangential convergence is a, is, a basic, um, is a basic concept in holomorphic function theory. So given a function f of z, which is holomorphic in the disk, the question is when does this function have an extension to the boundary? It's a classical question about holomorphic functions. Well, if f, <coughs> if f is bounded, or more generally satisfies this condition, then the radial limit exists. I guess I should have formulated this in the upper half space. One would have to say then the function along parallel lines, the supremum along any parallel line is an LP, then, then the, then the um, transverse limit exists. More generally, so this is a radial limit in the disk. More generally, I'll, if you pick a boundary point, this function, will, the limit will exist along any non-tangential curve coming into the boundary. So this is the non-tangential approach to the boundary, which already is a feature of holomorphic function theory. And this is what, um, this is what we're going to try to capture when we look at these Dirichlet problems for, for um, harmonic functions and more general variable coefficient functions. So, so the origins of all of this is in holomorphic, classical holomorphic function theory uh, of the early part of last century. So it, is it would be natural then to consider non-tangential approach regions to points in our domain. And so for every point x on the boundary on Rn, we're going to, def to, to fix a cone that, that is attached with vertex x. And this is my non-tangential approach region to x. I'm going to be looking at limits of functions as they travel along curves that are contained in this, in this non-tangential approach region, gamma of x. And in connection with the Dirichlet problem, I need to, to define two players, which measure, which measure something about solutions in non-tangential approach regions. Now, the first, um, the first uh, operator, the non-tangential maximal, uh, the non-tangential maximal function, is quite natural if you're looking at a limit, right? If you're looking at the limit and as we approach this in this non-tangential approach region, it's quite quite natural to look at a maximum. The maximum controls this limit. The other operator, the square function, might be more familiar to some of you from complex function theory, where it's it appears as an area integral or those of you in probability from the martingale, uh, a square function, it's related to little with Paley expressions. Again, it's, it's measuring something that has to do with the number of times the solution oscillates in this non-tangential approach region. The square function may not seem so natural from the point of view of limits, um, but, but if you take, uh, I want to show you this little computation just to convince you that it is connected to the boundary values of harmonic functions. If you take a harmonic, take the Poisson extension of a function which belongs to L2, and then the square function also belongs to L2. If you take the square function and you just in integrate this, change variables and integrate, and use the equation, this you'll get an intermediate ex uh, expression, t grad u squared features there. And that is equal to the integral of f squared on the boundary just by the divergence theorem. Now notice, notice this expression t grand u squared. This was exactly what featured in the Carlison measure characterization of BMO functions. And so in some sense, it's not in Carla, Charles Feffelman's observation is, is somehow quite natural. It, BMO is, is an L2 condition at, at every scale. And so th this Carlison measure is, is an L2 condition on this at every scale. Okay, so now I want to, to use these operators, in particular the non-tangential maximal function, to define what I mean by the Dirichlet problem for, let's say, harmonic functions in the upper half space with data that belongs to, it's not necessarily continuous, but it's measured in LP. 
So the problem is solvable in the sense uh, that the solution converges to its boundary data non-tangentially, if and only if this, this um, inequality between the non-tangential maximal function and the boundary data holds. So the non-tangential maximal function in LP is bounded by the data in LP. So that inequality gives both uh, existence and uniqueness. And, and there was, we could have equally as well, in the case of harmonic functions, used the square function to define uh, our, our uh, Dirichlet problem, because for harmonic functions, the LP norm of the square function and the non-tangential maximal function are the same. But that's for harmonic functions. Now let's, let's turn to these variable coefficient generalizations of the Laplacian in divergence form. And um, so he, here's our formulation. And so now at, at, at this point, I, I think I'll have to, to summarize about 10, 20 years of really groundbreaking work in the subject in about four sentences. So some things we're just going to have to take at face value in, in, in order to go on here. And, and uh, one of those is, well, let me, let me just say this in words. So, so we have, um, so you first might wonder how you even define a solution to this equation, right? You can't differentiate the coefficients. We're not making the assumption that the matrix of coefficients contains differentiable functions. So we don't just differentiate through the equation. So we have to define solutions in a weak sense. We have to define it so that we, you know, by some, by testing against functions and integration by parts. So this weak sense basically by, by Lax Milgram gives rise to weak solutions to this equation, solutions in the sense uh, that they belong to a Banach space, or uh, more precisely, a Sobolev space. So we have these weak solutions, that, and they're not necessarily continuous, but in fact, they necessarily are. So if the domain is regular enough, these weak solutions that we obtain through abstract functional analysis methods can actually be shown to be continuous, and even better, they're held or continuous of some order that only depends on the ellipticity of the operator. So given the continuity of these solutions and the fact that they share now some properties that harmonic functions have, for example, there's gonna be a maximum principle, there's a Harnack principle, they're, they're not Lipschitz continuous, but they're held or continuous of some order. So it turns out that solutions to these general divergence form equations with no particular assumptions now in the coefficients beyond saying that they're bounded and measurable, these solutions can be represented as a boundary integral of the boundary data against a measure. Well, unless you make any, some additional assumptions about the coefficients, you're not going to be able to say anything particularly good about the measure. So again, let me remind you that when the matrix is the identity, solutions are harmonic, and this is the harmonic measure. But now we have an elliptic operator, this is the elliptic measure, and, and if no additional assumptions are made on the matrix A, this elliptic measure may be even singular with respect to, to the Bay measure. So, um, as I said, the inter this interior regularity of solutions is this, is this famous de Georgi nash moser theory, which, which we, we don't have time to, to dwell on. So we'll simply have to start with the assumption that when we're talking about solving Dirichlet problems for elliptic operators, it's all about how regular this elliptic measure is. The non-tangential maximal function in this context is a weighted hardy littlewood maximal operator. And so the classical Muckenhout theory of weights that Thomas Sutinen spoke about the other day comes into play. Solvability of the Dirichlet problem is, as I said, it's equivalent to some precise condition on how regular the elliptic measure is compared to the leg measure. And it turns out that the Dirichlet problem is solvable for some p 
if and only if the radon nicotine derivative, the, ra the, the, the measure, how regular this elliptic measure is with respect to the bait measure, belongs to this class called A infinity, which means that basically these two measures are satisfy a quantified version of mutual absolute continuity. Now, we know what it means for two measures to be mutually absolutely continuous. It means that, that if the elliptic measure of a set is small, then the Lebesgue measure of a set is small. Or vice versa, if the Lebesgue measure is small, then the elliptic measure is small. A infinity is a condition that quantifies this. It says that this happens at every scale. So if you're not familiar with the definition of A infinity, then I advise you not to read the slide, but just take away the, the, the gist of the message here, which is to prove an, an A infinity condition, which is a precise regularity condition on measures, you need to show that at every scale, if the one measure is small, then the other measure is small, or vice versa. So one of the interesting things about the A infinity condition is that we're not saying that both one and two need to hold, we're saying that either one has to hold because they are all equivalent. It's this quantification at every scale that gives us this equivalent. Okay, so, so what is the program then for these divergence form elliptic <coughs> operators with, with measurable coefficients? Well, we, we're, asking, we're asking two questions. In the first place, what conditions on the matrix of coefficients can guarantee that the elliptic measure and the Lebesgue measure are mutually absolutely continuous, thus ensuring well-posedness and unique solvability of the Dirichlet problem for these operators? Alternatively, you know, one can ask what, what criteria can you use to prove this A infinity, a criteria that's expressed in terms of the solutions, and what, what criteria can be verified for large classes of these operators. And so, it, so I, I hope to, to, to show you that, that sharp, optimal answers to these questions are often found by means of, or in terms of, and measures. Okay, so let's, let me give some, some background um, the, to, to this in the context of real symmetric matrices. So the theory of real symmetric matrices unfolded over a period of time, and the program was really begun in the 1970s and 80s and pioneered by Caffarelli, Dahlberg, Fabes, Jarrison, Koenig, Prokota, and, and, and others. So um, one, of the, one of the ways we think about the, these real symmetric matrices, as I mentioned, is as the image of the Laplacian in a domain, let's say, above a Lipschitz graph, and then under a change of variables. So we're going to look at a particular example of this in, in a moment, but let's, let's stick with that, that, um, that beginning part, the Laplacian above a Lipschitz graph. Well, following, uh, following the work of, of Koenig in two dimensions, Dahlberg was the first to show that, that for harmon the harmonic function theory above a Lipschitz graph had a, had a solvable Dirichlet problem with as, as long as the data was in L2. And L2 was, turned out to be a sharp exponent there. You couldn't go below L2. Unlike the case of harmonic functions, you don't get an LP theory as soon as the domain is, is less than C1 when, when P, uh, uh, until P is bigger than two. So uh, going, returning to the story of changing variables, Let's, um, let's take a look at this divergence form operator with bounded measurable coefficients. So now we have our Laplacian above a Lipschitz graph, and let's do the simplest possible change of variable. Let's take the Lipschitz graph and just project it down. 
onto Rn. So it's just a flattening of the graph. So under that change of variables, this, um, the Laplacian is transformed, it, the solutions to the Laplacian are transformed into solutions of one of these divergence form, real symmetric divergence form operators. The, the, um, the coefficients of A now depend on the Jacobian of the change of variables. The flattening means that we're taking the Lipschitz, we have a Lipschitz graph and we're flattening, so that means that the coefficients now depend on the derivatives of the graph of that function. The function is Lipschitz, the derivatives are only bounded and measurable. So it looks like we have now gotten a, a quite general operator, bounded measurable coefficients. However, it has one redeeming feature, and that is that the coefficients of this matrix turn out to be independent of the transverse variable, of the time variable. So this class of operators, bounded and measurable, but independent of the time variable, is a larger class of operators, subsumes the, the, the operators that, that look like constant coefficient or the Laplacian above a Lipschitz graph. And Jerison and Koenig recognized that, um, that there was an L2 theory that, that, that drove this, that, that solved the Dirichlet problem for this larger class of operators with time-independent coefficients. They found an L2 identity of relic type that solved not just the Dirichlet problem, but also a host of other boundary value problems in L2, Neumann problem, regularity problem, and in fact their discovery of this particular L2 identity really drove the, the, the theory, uh, the progress in this area for, um, for a variety of operators and for systems and so forth, this relic type. This, so this L2 theory was a big part of this program in the 80s and 90s. And so what they did was, was with, their L, with their relic type identities, this gave rise to a large class of operators for which one could prove not just mutual absolute continuity, but, but much sharper estimates saying where the Dirichlet problem was solvable. In fact, it was solvable in L2. But if the coefficients depend on the transverse variable, then these Dirichlet problems for these operators need not be well posed. The, there were examples uh, that showed that some condition on the transverse variables were, was necessary. And these counterexamples were provided by Caffarelli, Fabes, Kendig. Dahlberg, in, um, in the mid 80s, uh, seeking to enlarge the class of operators for which one could understand solvability of these Dirichlet problems in the real and symmetric case, uh, considered perturbations of operators. So suppose you have a class of operators for which you know that the measure is good. You can solve the Dirichlet problem. Then if you perturb by something that's small enough, then you can still solve the Dirichlet problem for the perturbed operator. And so what do we mean by small enough? So here enters now the Carlson measure condition for, on coefficients. So now we, have, we, now we have a condition involving Carlson measures on coefficients of operators, which tells us when this perturbation theory works. A sharp characterization of this, of this condition, preserving A infinity, was given in a paper by Pfefferman, Kenning, and myself, and this has been the perturbation theory has later been extended to to uh, and, and there we also considered Lipschitz domains, not just the upper half space, and this has been pushed into domains with much weaker conditions on the geometry, as long as there's enough geometry to still define these tent spaces or Carlson measure regions. So the point here for, for the story involving real and symmetric matrices is that Carlson measure estimates yield sharp solvability results for a large class of operators. 
And now, in this real symmetric theory, which was largely developed, and so nothing, the complex coefficient case was still quite, quite a mystery. Progress had been, been made on various fronts, including um, elliptic, certain elliptic systems and higher order equations as well. But, but in every one of the cases in which you could make some progress, there was an L2 theory behind it. There was some L2 identity, there was some, some, something that, that drove the L2 theory. Now, it turns out that as soon as you lose the, the condition of symmetry of your matrix, you're in a different world. You're in a world where you don't have an, an L2 theory, and in fact, there are counterexamples to show that you don't have an L2 theory. So in this, in this context of real, say, real and non-symmetric matrices in which there's no L2 theory, there's also no technology to, to even get started on proving A infinity. So, uh, so new, new ideas, new techniques were needed to characterize this mutual absolute continuity or this A infinity condition. So now I see that I've entered the um, image compression part of my talk where I compress about 20 minutes of slides into, into 13 minutes, so, okay. <clears throat> All right, so let me tell you a little bit about um, some characterizations that were developed to try to, to, try to get a hold of, of finding of, of conditions that were checkable to determine A infinity. So let me introduce the following um, property of solutions called epsilon approximability. This is a property of solutions that again comes from harmonic theory. This, this is an idea that, that uh, um, was investigated by Garnett and Veropolis for harmonic functions. So we say that a solution or, or even a uh, function is epsilon approximable if we can find a, con a continuous function that's close to it that has this very special Carlson measure property. Again, so this is an L1 Carlson measure on the, on the approximation in contrast to the L2 Carlson measure condition on solutions itself. So it turns out that harmonic functions are always epsilon approximable. You can find such continuous functions relative to each P. P. How about solutions to these general divergence form elliptic equations? Well, it turns out that this property of epsilon approximability is equivalent to the, to the mutual absolute continuity, to the regularity of the measure. But it's still not quite so satisfying because it's not exactly easy to check that a solution is epsilon approximable. It's not so easy to find that continuous function. How do you verify it? Well, we, we introduced a different, another characterization that turns out also to be equivalent, namely that it's equivalent to the existence of a P such that this non-tangential maximal function and the square function are, have the same LP norms. Remember that this was true for all harmonic functions. It's not true in general that this for, for these elliptic matrices. When it holds, it will imply some regularity of the measure. Believe it or not, that's a checkable condition. It doesn't look too checkable, but we, it, it was used to, to, to provide um, examples of large classes of operators now for which, um, for which the conclusion A infinity is sharp. And, and one of them is the class of matrices where the coefficients themselves satisfy a Carlson measure condition and this has also had further applications to non-divergence form, um, second order equations, as well as regularity of solutions to the P-Laplace Okay, So as I said, this um, condition uh, on the epsilon approximability, uh, first, uh, the, the first clue that this had anything to do with mutual absolute continuity was given in this uh, this book of, of Garnett, in which he proves what he calls a quantitative Fatu theorem from such a condition. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about why this, about how you use epsilon approximability to get A infinity. 
So what we're going to show is that if the elliptic measure is small, then the Lebesgue measure is small. So we do that by saying, well, if you've got a small set of small elliptic measure, we're going to construct a function on the boundary whose solution oscillates a large number of times in a non-tangential region above it. And if it oscillates a large number of times by a fixed amount, then specifically, at least for the approximate, which is close to it, it's oscillating a lot, the approximate will oscillate a lot. So specifically for the approximate, we can prove that this quantity that looks like an L1 version of the square function is bounded from below by a large number that depends on epsilon. And then if we integrate this over a set E with respect to the big measure, we'll obtain that the measure of E is also small. So we proved A infinity in this case by using small elliptic measure implies small Lebesgue measure. And we basically uh, heavily relied on this Carlson measure property of the approximate. But this was uh, um, not so satisfying because it was not a Carlson measure property on the solution itself. So we looked for a, a Carlson measure property on the solution itself that was equivalent to A infinity. And we later proved that, that if the solution, that if the solution with BMO data had a Carlson, had the classical Carlson measure estimate that Charles Pfefferman observed for harmonic functions, then that was equivalent to A infinity. So again, um, this, this, so this is a, this is the same type of result that we have in, a, in um, uh, that we have for harmonic functions. Let me just say a couple of words about how we prove this, um, because we're going to use the other way of characterizing a infinity. We're going to suppose that the Lebesgue measure is small, and show that the elliptic measure is small. So there's a key estimate. And that is that the elliptic measure of a set E can be bounded by this Carlson measure condition T grad U squared being, by, it can be bounded by this expression that looks like this, that invokes this Carlson measure condition T grad U squared. So U is a solution to, a, to a, 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 an elliptic, this elliptic problem with boundary data F. F has to take the value 1 on the set E, and it has to be 0 outside of the, the cube, and it could be anything else in between. So now, remember that our objective is to prove that the elliptic measure is small. So if we, we could actually just take f to be the characteristic function of the set E, but then we wouldn't necessarily get something small here, because this Carlson measure condition is bounded, has this, this, this we're assuming is bounded by the BMO norm of the boundary data. So we have to find a function f that satisfies those boundary conditions that has small BMO norm. Fortunately, that's been done for us. Jones and Journet constructed a function that satisfied those conditions with small BMO norm for an entirely different problem, weak convergence in, in H1. And, and that's the function. So using this construction, we, we can show that, so now we have that this, this is small, so we can show that the Lebesgue measure is small implies the Carlson measure is small. But again, this is not totally satisfying because as you can see from that example, well, let me just go back one slide. As you can see from this example, you can have a bounded function whose BMO norm is a lot smaller than its L infinity norm. And so checking that, that something is bounded by a BMO norm is a lot harder than checking that it's bounded by its L infinity norm. So here's a sort of optimal Carlson measure characterization of A infinity. And that is that, that, that the, the Carlson measure condition need only hold for bounded functions and that the bound is in terms of the L infinity norm. 
And in fact, not just for not just for any bounded function, but for but for characteristic functions of Borel sets and, and possibly for characteristic functions of dyadic cubes, but haven't I have checked that. So here are some applications of this um, uh, of this whole development for proving a infinity by Carlson measure characterizations on the solution. So one of the applications is to is to non-symmetric matrices with time independent coefficients. Again, remember we don't have an L2 theory. A infinity, if it exists for all of these matrices, is the sharp condition. And in dimension two, we we prove this. We could prove this. Um, based on this epsilon approximability and, and, and equivalence between square functions and non-tangential maximal functions. But it took, a, it took us another 15 years to figure out how to do this in, in n dimensions. And that's largely because we needed all of the technology that was developed to solve this uh, Kato uh, square root conjecture that I alluded to at the beginning. And in, in the solvability of, the, of that problem for the Cotton square root conjecture, key estimates using Carlson measures came into play as well. So this, this new criterion simplifies the proof of this theorem, uh, this 2013 theorem. And in fact, uh, a, a further simplification in the construction allows uh, Martin Jindesh and Stephanie Peter Minkel and I to, to push this characterization to parabolic operators. And so that opens up the door to, to a larger class, of, to solvability for a larger class of parabolic operators, which again builds on previous work that, that was initiated by Hoffman Lewis and, and pushed to a larger class of operators by, by Jindosh and Huang. Okay, so I think I'm just about out of time, and I would like to thank um, the IMU Organizing Committee for this invitation. I would like to say to the local organizers, Komsamita, and I'd like to thank my, my collaborators, as well as others that were too numerous to list here, that, that have all made fundamental contributions to this active and, grow, and growing area of research. And apologies if I didn't put your name here, but um, thank you. Are there any questions? <coughs> so if not, then the let's thank our last speaker again.